introduce our speaker this evening. It's Veronica Bowers, and um, we're very pleased to have, have her do this presentation. She is the director and founder of Native Songbird Care and Conservation based in Sebastopol, so very close to us. Veronica, thank you so much for speaking, and I'll give you the floor. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to just hop into screen share and get the opening screen up. All right. So um, I'm Veronica Bowers with Native Songbird Care and Conservation. We are a state and federally licensed wildlife rehabilitation hospital in Sonoma or Sebastopol, California, up in Sonoma County. And we're a specialty hospital for native songbirds. Um, part of our mission is to provide educational outreach and community engagement. So on the property of native songbird care is a little over an acre demonstration garden. It was actually, I started it um, almost 20 years ago now to create habitat for the songbirds just in our neighborhood. We're in a semi-urban rural area in Sebastopol and lots of open space around us. And when we first bought the property, um, I guess 24 years ago now, it was just a big open space with a few remnant um, Monterey pines and dug firs because once upon a time, our property was a Christmas tree farm and most of them had been taken out, but there were a few left over. So I really had a blank canvas to start from, but um, because it was a blank canvas, there just weren't a lot of songbirds and I really wanted to support them. And about that time, I also was very involved in our local Audubon chapter, was doing a lot of birding out in our open space preserves and natural areas and beginning to observe and make that very deep um, connection between our songbirds and our native plants in California. So I set out to create habitat in our garden and the garden officially became a component of our educational and outreach program for native songbird care, I'd say about seven years ago. And so the garden has an official name, it's called the Songbird Sanctuary Gardens. And the mascot of the garden is the Black Phoebe. Um, so she kind of rules the roost and owns the property, um, bosses everybody around, but we have a pretty diverse um, habitat in that um, little over one acre garden. And we have over 30 species of songbirds who nest here and almost a hundred different species of, of songbirds who have either um, call the garden home throughout the year. They're a resident species or they're um, a species who's only here for the breeding season or they might be a species who flies from the north and spends the winter with us. So we have quite a diversity of habitat and quite a diversity of songbirds. And I'm going to just tell you in the wildscaping presentation um, kind of what you can create in your own garden to support the songbirds and biodiversity in your area. One thing I will mention is that the Songbird Sanctuary Garden is open for tours. We have regular tours May through August, the second Saturday of the month, 1030 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. and you can get more information on our website. But we also have an open house on December 2nd, which is part of our annual fundraiser, but we open up the garden for self-guided tours on that day as well. So you can see what our native plant garden looks like in its winter slumber, which I think is still beautiful and alive and dramatic um, in its own way. That's a little, looks like early spring there with the iris and the hookra. So we'll get on to wildscaping, how to support songbirds in, and biodiversity in your own backyard and beyond. So songbird populations are in decline and there are many drivers um, causing that decline. Habitat loss, of course, is the overarching theme. And when you have loss of habitat, you have loss of biodiversity. 
And when biodiversity starts to decline, all of those essential resources that our songbirds require to survive and thrive out there in the natural world um, diminish. And so then it, it's very difficult for them to migrate, live their daily life, um, breed and raise young without all of those essential um, vital resources. Um, when we have habitat loss, we also end up with a human altered landscape. And again, serious lack of resources with the human altered landscape. And with that, we humans bring a lot of threats that don't naturally occur out there in the world for songbirds. So things like windows and light pollution and the introduction of non-native species all put added pressure on our songbird populations. But the good news is that we can do a little bit to restore nature and support our songbirds in our own backyards. And that begins by utilizing native plants. So um, since all of you are affiliated with the California Native Plant Society, um, you know that native plants are the cornerstone, the very foundation of a healthy environment. And um, it's the brick and mortar of healthy functioning biomes and ecosystems. So when we set out on our journey to restore a little bit of nature in our own backyards, um, we're striving to provide habitat for the birds and the insects and more through the use of native plants. And when we're able to garden with native plants, we are able to increase the natural areas in our backyard, which will then provide uh, homes and food for wildlife. So not just our songbirds, but you know, once you start creating and supporting biodiversity in your own backyards, you get everything from gray foxes to great horned owls and of course, all of our fabulous songbirds. But when we create areas of wildlife habitat in our own backyards, we have the opportunity to enlarge that space and connect to larger greener areas. So if you have a local park that's adjacent to your backyard or maybe a conservation easement or maybe uh, you're near an open space district or perhaps even your next door neighbor has already embarked on the native plant gardening journey, you've increased that area of biodiversity and habitat. And the other benefit of native plants is that you're going to reduce your water usage, obviously, which is um, important for a lot of us in California. But because our California native plants have evolved with the California climate, many of them are drought tolerant and drought hardy. And of course, if we're gardening with native plants, we're also not using a lot of things like chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and we're generally not using a lot of gas-powered gardening equipment either because we're going for a natural landscape, and we're also utilizing plant material that doesn't require a lot of that um, artificial maintenance. So photo screenshot of housing density back in 1940 that the eastern part of the U.S. Um, was you see a lot of green space. So there's less housing density in those darker um, to sort of medium green areas. And then projected to 2030, you can see that the green areas have diminished substantially and that the housing density areas have really lit up. So what that means is there is a lot of human habitation there and very little habitat left for um, wildlife. And this might be a bird's eye view of what some of that housing density looks like. So you can see that it's a lot of concrete and asphalt um, and lots of things to make humans comfortable, but not a lot for our songbirds. And if we zoomed in even closer and looked at some of those little patches of green probably what we would see are lawns and ornamental shrubs and perennials and um, trees that are not native to the area. And so as um, a bird who is looking for a place to nest, um, a place to find food to feed their young, perhaps they're stopping over during migration to refuel so they can carry on to Central and South America, these little patches of green aren't going to be very nourishing or sustain um, any aspect really of their life history. 
So you're probably very familiar with this graphic from Douglas Tallamy, but so he's an ecologist and entomologist, and he has really um, been promoting this important message of restoring nature in our own backyards by utilizing native plants. Um, well, I guess his first book was published 10 or 14 years ago, um, Bringing Nature Home. But this is a pretty important graphic. So what this says is basically our past criteria as gardeners um, to choose plants for our landscaping needs was primarily focused on decorative value. And of course, you know, functional things like privacy screens or a focal point, point like a big magnolia tree in the middle of the lawn or something like that. But moving forward, if we start embracing the use of native plants in our home gardens, we can balance that need for decorative value with our ecosystem services. Um, so our native plants um, have tremendous value for increasing the food web in our backyards, um, soil restoration, carbon sequestration, watershed value. Um, so tremendous value is brought to the natural world, brought to the environmental health and frankly, our human health, when we can replace pansies and petunias with something like goldenrod and asters, um, because it not only benefits us and our aesthetics, but it also benefits the greater world. So here's a little Google Earth um, screenshot of the area where I live in Sebastopol. Um, the little yellow arrow points to um, our plot of property on Elf Road. And you, you can see there's a dark green swath kind of at the tip of that. Well, that's a little creek and there's there's a little conserv conservation easement back there. So as I was creating uh, my garden and creating habitat, I was able to um, connect to that conservation easement and increase that area of wild space for our wildlife. Um, but you can see, again, from a bird, all of that land is very developed. It's either there's a lot of human habitations and housing developments, and then if you go east towards Santa Rosa, uh, a lot more of the urban sprawl is occurring. So even though it looks mostly green, it's not really inviting um, landscapes for our wildlife, particularly our songbirds. So 20-ish years later, what we were able to create by utilizing native plants is a thriving um, habitat that sustains all manner of songbirds, tons of insects, butterflies, moths, you name it. Um, and we have connected to that larger green space, which you can see just beyond the live oaks and the back of the screen off on the horizon. And we have some neighbors who are also really into creating habitat in their backyards utilizing native plants. So Elphick Road is becoming quite the biodiverse um, hotspot in Sebastopol. So restoring native plants to our gardens and communities is vital to biodiversity. Where would we begin if we set out to wildscape our gardens? Well, the first thing we'd wanna do is we'd start taking a look at any of the alien ornamentals we have that can be replaced with natives. And I have this little photo in the background of a Bewix wren. Um, and behind the Bewix wren is Mexican marigold and um, some kind of little climbing rose. It, it's been so long since I ripped that out. Um, I don't remember which rose it was, but that was a there before we got there and it was a messy little thicket of rose and mexican marigold i think there was a rock rose somewhere buried in there trying to grow as well and the wren never hunted for insects in there but used it as a little transit zone from one side of the property to the other because it was a thick tangly mess of vegetation which wrens love to hide in and skulk around and i'm sure they found little tiny spiders and such but that was one of the areas that was first to go. And it's since been uh, replaced with um, Arctostophilus and Ceanothus um, and some other lower growing um, shrubs. 
And now it's a dense, tangly thicket of natives where not only does the wren continue to transit through that area, but also makes a long stopover to hunt for insects as well. So one thing that's really important is you wanna research the native flora and fauna in your area, figure out what plants grow best in your area and who are the species that you wanna try and support with those native plants. If you have lawn, um, reduce it or consider removing it altogether. And think about where you're going to have the greatest impact in your garden. Um, is the neighbor to the west of you already starting a native plant garden? And the neighbor to the east of you has um, lawn and lava rock. Maybe it might be good to start your native plant garden to the west so that you can hook up with your neighbor who's already on board with the native plants and increase your area together. You will have some key components of the wildscape garden. So food, which will come from native plants, habitat structure, which will also come from the plant material providing shelter and nesting sites. Obviously a water feature of some, port, of some sort is gonna be important. And then once you have it all put together and it's functioning and thriving, you'll have to take on the role of stewardship. So one of the reasons that native plants are so vitally important to our songbirds is that native plants support insects. And we'll get more into that in a moment, but the important thing to know about insects is that they are specialists. So they have relationships and physiological adaptations with their host plant lineage. So they can't lay their eggs and their larva can't go on to grow and then become the adult form of insect they're destined to be without their specific host plant. And 90% of our herbivorous insects can only eat the plants with which they've co-evolved. So it's really important to know, again, researching the flora and fauna of your area, know which plants you need to sustain the various moths and butterflies, et cetera, um, in your area so that you can get the maximum value out of all of the plant material that you're going to be choosing. And if we, um, if our insects can't eat the native plants, then obviously the very foundation of our food chain ceases to exist. So if we have the proper native plants, then we're going to sustain our insects. And then of course, our songbirds who are dependent on insects um, will thrive. And then of course, other members of our wild community will also thrive. So um, the gray fox also hunts birds. Um, the Cooper's hawk also hunts birds. The great hand owl is going to probably pick off a skunk here and there. So if you have a thriving diverse habitat um, and you're inviting all members of the natural world, then you have a complete food web existing there. And not only that, but you're also helping your human health as well. So if we're sustaining all of our pollinators, at least one third of our own food is pollinated by pollinator insects. So we're not just talking about the European honeybee, we're talking about the thousands of different um, native bee species that we can support when we have the proper habitat for them. So a world without insects is a world without biological diversity. These are two really great books, by the way, which talk a lot about the need to support our insect populations. And um, Douglas Tallamy speaks directly to the native plants and how that sustains our insect populations, which then in turn sustain our songbird populations. So this is something I knew long before I read any of Doug Douglas Tallamy's um, books, but because I am a songbird specialist working exclusively with songbirds as a wildlife rehabilitator, I know what baby birds eat. Um, so 96% of our songbirds are fed an all insect diet by their parents. There's a couple of um, species like birds in the finch family, house finches, goldfinches. They eat primarily plant material. 
and they get their protein from that plant material. But everybody else is fed insects and they are primarily fed the larval form of those insects. So if we don't have the plants that are sustaining those insects and form feeding the larval form of those insects, then our songbirds are not gonna have enough to eat. So in Douglas Tallamy's um, book, Bringing Nature Home, he uses the example of a pair of chickadees bringing approximately 600 caterpillars uh, to the nest for 16 days. And an average clutch size of chickadees is anywhere from four to six babies. So that's a lot of caterpillars for the first two weeks of their life. But then after they fledge, those parents continue care of their babies for another three to four weeks. And they are still dutifully bringing them um, little bills full of larval forms of the insects. So that is a lot of larvae. And we can't sustain those larvae populations without the native plants. So you see where I'm going with this? Native plants are the foundation of everything. <laughs> so we want to support our pollinators. We're not going to go into too much detail about this, but a lot of delicious, delectable larvae for baby birds comes from our pollinators. And um, pollinators are not just our butterflies, bees and moss, but they're flies, wasps, beetles, um, even some of our songbirds, um, hummingbirds in particular, are pollinators as well as bats. So it's important to provide the habitat that supports each stage of the life cycle for those pollinators. Um, so you'll need your native host plants. And there are a lot of good resources out there to figure out which host plants you need. Calscape is one of them. It'll give you a list of plants for your area and a potential list of um, particularly butterflies that occur in your area. And then, of course, you'll need um, the nectar and pollen plants for the adult forms of those insects as well. It's important to be aware of what the nesting sites and shelter looks like for some of those insects. So obviously the eggs will be laid on host plants and those can be everything from herbaceous plants to trees and shrubs. And um, you'll be able to determine when you do your research what kind of food and shelter the caterpillars are going to need. Um, and again, remember that they are specialists, so there's very specific species um, of plants that you'll need for various types of the moths and the butterfly. And in your research, you'll learn about keystone species. So native oaks in particular are what we consider heavy hitter keystone species. Um, and they have the uh, capability of supporting hundreds of species of moths and butterflies. We have a lot of live oak on our property. And I can tell you that it is laden with larvae um, during the early part of the breeding season and that most of the songbirds on our property are heavily gleaning and foraging the larvae off the live oaks to feed their young. But other important species are willow and um, cherry or prunus species of trees. So again, Calscape is a great resource to determine the host plants that you might need for certain butterflies and moths for your area. And um, again, I won't go into too much detail, but it's also important to learn a little bit about how you need to, to support your bee populations, um, your native bee populations. Um, the Xerces Society, uh, xerces.org is an excellent resource with tons of information about where our different bee species nest. Some nest in the ground, others are cavity nesters. And um, the different aspects of habitat that they require to survive and thrive. So um, we have bare patches in our garden that have not been mulched over. We have brush piles in our garden. And we also are very careful about what we um, prune and trim back in terms of our shrubs and our annuals and our perennials, um, taking care not to destroy any nesting sites or wintering sites for not just bees, but for all types of insects. 
And this is an example. This is a red elderberry. And I do leave a lot of dead wood on our elderberry because I know that there are certain bee species that will be nesting in there. And although I want the bees to thrive um, and hatch, I also know that their little nest sites are a food source for certain species of birds. So you can see the um, photo that's on your right. Well, that's the work of a titmouse. Um, he was boring little holes in that dead stem of the red elderberry because he knew that there were bee larvae in there and he made a pretty good meal out of it. And of course, we want to take care not to use pesticides in our wildscaped gardens because pesticides are not only bad for us, but they're bad for all of your wild neighbors as well. So there's four basic food groups that we can um, support for the birds by making some good choices um, of the plants in our garden. And those four basic food groups are insects. So there's plants that we're gonna use that support insect populations so we can provide insects for the birds. There are berry producing plants, there are nectar producing plants, and of course there are all different types of plant material that provide nuts and seeds. So the insect buffet might include a mixture of a meadow type of habitat that would have grasses and annuals and perennials. Um, goldenrod, aster, and different types of sunflowers are excellent um, sources to have in your meadow um, to attract and sustain insect life. And then there's keystone species, as we spoke about uh, a few seconds ago, for caterpillars. Um, our native oaks, of course, are major keystone species, and willows also super productive for um, providing um, insects. And then shrubs, um, I am always uh, mesmerized by the life that occurs on coyote brush. Um, all manner of insect uh, is on the coyote brush in our garden. And we have adult form and egg form and larva form of various insects. And then we have, I don't even know how many species of bees, um, birds and bees that are foraging all over the coyote brush. So it's like a, a little mini market <laughs> in the middle of the garden. I love coyote brush. Um, and of course, Ceanothus and coffeeberry are also excellent insectary plants. So this is one little zone um, in our garden. There's a coyote brush and coffee berry and then Catalina cherry, which yes, I know it's from Southern California. Uh, it's been there a long time. I didn't know better, um, but it attracts a lot of insect life. And then of course it produces these fabulous berries and the birds love that shrub and they are constantly foraging on it at all times of year. But this little corner with these three plants, you actually, during the late spring and early summer, you can hear it before you see it because it is buzzing with insect activity. So berries and fruit, um, you can plant something in your garden that is producing fruit almost every single month of the year uh, when it comes to native plants. We're really lucky in our area that um, so much grows and thrives here. But coffee berry um, is generally ripe late summer, early fall. Same with our native grape. Then you have different species of ribes that typically are gonna be ripe in the early to late spring. Elderberry is a summer fruit. Toyon, also known as Christmas berry, is uh, bearing ripe berries in the, the winter. Twin berry, again, um, sort of a summer, late spring. Snowberry, you know, some birds eat it. There, We have ripe snowberry in the garden right now. And um, I think of it as like a desperation fruit. Um, sometimes I see the hermit thrush eat it. I don't think they love it. I think they eat it when everything else um, is gone and maybe the toyon isn't ripe yet, um, but they do eat it. And then of course, native strawberries, any of our native um, prunus or cherries, huckleberry, salmonberry, thimbleberry, 
all excellent sources of berries and fruit. It just depends on where you're located and the conditions you have to sustain any of those fabulous plants. So the seasonal pantry, when I'm putting plants into the garden and um, creating different zones, I'm thinking about um, what's ripe at what time of year or what's producing seed at what time of year. And I wanna make sure that all of the birds who are occurring, either visiting or living in our garden at that time of year are able to find food. So we have different vegetation that's bearing fruit or flowers um, at all times of the year. In fact, I really can't think of a month out of the calendar year in our garden um, where everybody can't find something that they need. Um, even December, where most people think, oh, you know, not much going on in December. It's not true. We have Toyon and we have the Arctostophilus blooming and we have the um, red flowering current blooming. So, and because we don't deadhead any of our annuals or perennials, we have lots of seed heads that are all over the place. So everybody's happy. All of our food needs are taken care of for our songbirds. So this is, um, one of our elderberry bushes and the black-headed grosbeaks, we usually have one to two pairs nesting in the garden. They always bring their kids over uh, late summer. So you can see the kids are about juvenile age and, and gorging on um, blue elderberries, usually late July. By late summer and fall, all of our coffee berry is ripe, and that happens to coincide with the time that our western tanagers are migrating through. And I can stop at any one of our coffee berry bushes in the Songbird Sanctuary Gardens at around that time, and it will be dotted with beautiful bright yellow birds, and um, all of those bright yellow birds will have purple stained beaks because they've been gorging on ripe coffee berry. And then, of course, the toyon is ripe in December, and winter happens to be the time of year where all of the cedar waxwings from further north and the American robins have migrated down to the Bay Area for the winter. And they are, um, well, the cedar waxwings in particular, they are ferrugivores, which means they eat fruit for a living. And so they are seeking out the ripe toyon berries. Um, and these are very nutritious for them. It helps them maintain their weight um, and pack on a lot of fat stores so they can thrive and stay healthy through the winter. Nectar sources in the garden um, in terms of native California plant choices are never ending, abundant, overwhelming almost. And again, you can have something blooming and providing nectar in your garden year round. Um, Anna's hummingbirds happen to be a species of bird that occur year round in the Bay Area. They are nectarivores, although they eat a substantial amount of insects, they are always seeking nectar sources. So if you have Arctostophilus or Ribes growing in your garden, your Anna's hummingbird is gonna be very grateful to you in December when everything else is dormant. And these particular plants have abundant um, blossoms and nectar producing sources. You also have wonderful choices for the summer. You've got monkey flower, a whole variety of salvias, um, quite a variety of native honeysuckles, lots of mallow, and then of course, aster, our buckwheats are very popular um, with the hummingbirds and different penstemons. So not only do our hummingbirds appreciate nectar, but Orioles appreciate nectar sources, and of course, all of our pollinators appreciate nectar sources. Here's a little Anna's hummingbird who is enjoying some um, epilobium, I believe it's canum, 
and uh, the garden looks like it's on fire right now, even though we're into fall already, all of our epilobium is still going gangbusters and blooming. And there's a lot of fighting out in the garden because different anise hummingbirds own different patches of those epilobium. But there's also a lot of bees and butterflies on them as well. So you can get a lot of longevity out of the blooms um, from the epilobium. They usually start blooming around early August here, and we will often have blooms going through the end of November. So nuts and seeds, obviously there are quite a few native tree species that are great sources of nuts and seeds for different finch species and sparrow species, um, obviously our oak tip mice and chestnut back chickadees and variety of jays um, all enjoy nuts and seeds. But there's also a lot of shrubs that will provide those resources as well. So sagebrush, coyote brush, um, great shrubs to provide seeds. Saltbush or atroplex, some people call it saltbush, some people call it quail bush, but um, shrubs that are in the atroplex group, um, great food resource for our finch species. So they'll take the little seeds on there, but they also eat the tender tips um, of the leaves just as they're developing during spring and summer. They will eat those themselves, but they'll also feed that plant material to their young. So when someone asks us if, um, you know, should we stop feeding birds with the bird feeder um, because it's drawing rats or because we saw a sick bird at the bird feeder, but we still really want to enjoy the finches and the sparrows, what do you suggest? We always suggest looking at planting an atroplex because they're a natural bird feeder for those species. They're evergreen. They've evolved to sustain that kind of pressure. In fact, we have um, brush rabbits in our garden and they browse the base of our salt bush. Um, but the salt bush says, go ahead, eat all you want. I'm just going to grow more. So our salt bush always looks big, robust, and lush, even though it has birds eating from the outside and brush rabbits eating from the inside. Um, obviously, any of our native grasses are excellent sources of seed. And then, of course, there's a whole host of annuals and perennials that are wonderful sources of seed. The trick is, is you need to be tolerant with not deadheading that type of vegetation. So leave the seed heads there. If you're really fastidious and you just can't uh, resist the urge to deadhead, then take your clippings and you can lay them down in the garden bed so that one, you're not disposing of overwintering insects, but also you're leaving all of those seed sources available for the juncos and the wintering sparrows who are here and depend on those food resources. So these are some of the food resources in our garden. You can see we've got the buckwheat and the monkey flower, and we've got seaside daisy. Um, if you come here in the dead of December, you'll see that I have not deadheaded any of those items and that they're covered with goldfinches and house finches and golden crown sparrows, and they're eating the seeds. And then here's a little photo of a house finch who is nibbling the tender tips of the salt bush. And then of course, white crown sparrow, they're doing this right now. They're feasting on the flowers of the coyote bush. Um, this is a little patch of mule fat that we have in the garden. And although, so there's little teeny tiny gray birds on there and those are bush tits. And although bush tits are known to take seeds, tiny seeds, what they are doing in this little video is they're gleaning little tiny insects from the flower heads of the mule fat. And um, this just happened to be kind of a cold November day and it was a little bit hard to find food and they came down low in this patch of mule fat, knowing full well that they would find some insect life in there. Um, and very adeptly dangled on the tips of each of those little branches uh, to get their fill of insects. No matter the size of space, 
you have available to you in your garden, you can still make an impact even if that space is small. So there are a lot of native plants that actually are amenable to being planted in raised beds and flower pots. And CNPS's website has um, a great list, um, Calscape also, but there are a lot of resources out there to help people create a wildscape um, in their own backyards, even if it means it might be a patio garden um, in some pots or a raised planter bed. So don't let the amount of space discourage you. There's something for everybody there. We all have an opportunity to participate in this and sustain our songbirds and um, native plants. One of the other important things to think about um, as you're creating a habitat for songbirds and, and sustaining biodiversity is structural habitat. So in particular, when we think about birds and where they nest, um, for some, it might come as a surprise that uh, not all birds nest in trees. There's actually various layers within the environment that birds nest, particularly songbirds. So we have obviously the overstory or the canopy, which is comprised of trees primarily. Then we have the midstory, which generally consists of um, like the understory, basically a lot of different shrub types. And then we have the understory, which is uh, our ground covers, our low growing annuals, perennials, um, et cetera, grasses. So the mid story is actually where most songbirds prefer to nest. And that zone is anywhere from five to eight feet from the ground. So when you're setting out to create that wildscape and you want to invite the songbirds in not just to eat there but to actually live year round in your garden um, live and thrive throughout their entire year round life history um, you need to provide structural habitat so that structural habitat is going to provide essential nesting sites for the species who occur in your area and also safe places to roost and shelter during the day so these photos represent all three of those zones. So we have an Anna's hummingbird there in the lower left who is nesting way up high in a live oak and has masterfully camouflaged her tiny little nest with lichen. So she blends right into those branches. Then in a patch of hummingbird sage, we have a spotted toey nest and then in the middle of that Catalina cherry, <laughs> we have a California toey nesting. So three different zones within the habitat structure um, that the songbirds in our garden have utilized for nesting. We also have nest boxes um, and our, our uh, Western bluebirds love the nest boxes, but we also have dead snags on the property that woodpeckers have excavated and nested in and the bluebirds have used the natural cavities as well. It's important to acknowledge that when you are restoring nature in your backyard or creating habitat in your backyard, that you are not only supporting the breeding birds and supporting the birds who might be there for the winter or the California toey that you have year round, but you also are playing a vital role in um, basically creating a, a mini mart or a gas station, <laughs> a refueling stop for all of our migratory birds. So migratory birds are dependent on habitat through every step of their journey. So when they're north Northern um, breeding grounds, they need habitat to raise their young and find food. In their southern wintering grounds, they need habitat to find food and sustain themselves through, you know, the three to four months of winter. But all that time in between when they're flying from north to south and again south to north in the spring, they'll stop over in multiple locations every 300 miles or more 
they'll make a stop to refuel themselves. So if our gardens are rich with habitat and abundant with food resources that we're providing through native plants, then we're also providing essential refueling stations for these migratory songbirds who can then make the, way, the rest of their journey to wherever it is they're going, whether it's spring migration or fall migration. Other things that we need to think about in our garden is providing homes, not just for songbirds, but for all the other creatures that we're gonna draw in because we're sustaining biodiversity now with this amazing array of native plants. So things like logs and rocks are amazing homes for different types of insects, lots of spiders and beetles, and they also attract um, various reptiles and amphibians um, and give them places to live and dwell also. I am a huge advocate for leaving dead trees when it is safe to do so. We have a lot of snags on our property and those snags are filled with life. They are providing homes and food for all kinds of creatures, not just birds. Um, so we, when we do our tree trimming in the fall and winter, we'll utilize larger branches to line the pathways throughout the garden. And underneath the pathways, underneath the logs, we might have slender salamanders living um, on top of the logs. There might be western fence lizards hunting for insects. Inside the logs, there might be all kinds of larvae. And as those logs start to decay, the skunks will come along and rip them apart and eat the larvae. Um, and then the logs will continue to decompose. Eventually different fungus will take over and break them down. And then the logs will reintegrate into the garden as soil. So they're very important from beginning to end. Um, the trees are from life to death they sustain a lot of life in the garden. Here's a black Phoebe. Uh, we used a broken limb from one of our black oaks, actually live oak, I guess, on the edge of our pond for Phoebe to hunt from. And here's a great example of some other logs in the garden in the decomposition process. We've got a lot of great um, fungal activity happening, happening here. Um, and that is all of that is helping it retreat back into the soil um, to nourish the ground and the plants that are growing above. Water, of course, is an essential element in any garden. Um, so not just for our songbirds, but, you know, frogs and butterflies, everybody needs water, including your plants. Um, water might be as simple as a plant saucer on your back deck um, that you're cleaning every day. You always want to make sure your water sources are fresh um, or you may have a small pond. Um, Embracing water and utilizing water in other ways like basins and swales or rain gardens um, are an excellent way to manage the abundant rainfall <laughs> that we had last winter and apparently are predicted to get this winter. Um, we have a pretty extensive series of basins and swales throughout our garden. You can see that little top um, photo there is an example of what some of our basins look like um, during a rain event. And for us, what that does is it helps keep the water on our land and it prevents the rainwater from running over uh, the topsoil in the garden and then carrying it all down to the creek. Um, so instead, the water stays and it sinks down to our aquifer because we're on well here. So the basins and swales are pretty important in our garden, but they also nourish all of those plants that um, are designed to have their feet wet during winter and then dry out a bit during summer. So we don't have any irrigation in our garden. Everything um, sustains itself on whatever um, water we get during the winter. So now that you have created this thriving hub of nature, this beautiful biome in your backyard with all your native plants, and you've attracted the songbirds and their raising families, and you have abundant butterfly species and moths and lizards and great horned owls, um, now we wanna take on the role of steward.
Um, so what does that mean? That means that we want to make sure that we are mindful um, and we're not putting in a bunch of threats and hazards that will put a lot of pressure on this wildlife that we're endeavoring to support. So one thing we want to be careful about is the breeding season. So songbirds are the masters of disguise. Um, they're a prey species, so their very survival and existence depends on them being able to blend into the background when predators are near and to protect their babies. So their nests are tiny, they're discreet, and they're well camouflaged, which makes it really difficult to spot them if you're out in your garden in the middle of summer and you're thinking you'd like to do some heavy pruning or maybe you'd like to cut some limbs back on a tree, there's a high likelihood that you're going to displace some nesting songbirds. So save tree trimming and clearing vegetation for fall and winter when we know our songbirds are not breeding and trying to raise their young. Leave the leaves. Um, we just rake our leaves off the pathways into the garden beds because there are a lot of different life stages of insect matter that are in those leaves overwintering. And our songbirds, particularly our ground foraging songbirds like the spotted toey here, do a lot of hop scratch foraging through that leaf litter, either looking for insects or maybe even looking for seeds that are buried under the leaves. But the leaves are also an excellent source of mulch. So we're very um, strong advocates of leaving the leaves in the garden. I'm really happy to see that the impacts of light pollution are starting to become more mainstream. We're seeing more articles in the media coming out about them. People are talking about um, light pollution as a conservation crisis because it is. But um, we don't have any outdoor lighting um, on our property and um, we really encourage our neighbors not to have it either. Um, light pollution is a serious issue. So it affects our migratory songbirds in a big way. Um, you may have recently read an article about a massive migratory movement of songbirds through the Midwest, um, along the Central Flyway, particularly through Chicago. And one so Chicago is a lights out city. So is San Francisco. So is Oakland. What that means is during per peak migratory periods, um, commercial office buildings are encouraged to turn out their lights or reduce the number of lights they have on so that they don't cause light pollution, which disorients migratory songbirds. Most of our migratory songbirds migrate at night. Not a lot of people realize that. And when there is light pollution, casting up into the starry sky, um, it diffuses the starry sky. The songbirds can't see it. And they do as one of their migratory um, navigation tools. They do use the sky. Um, the night sky as a cost to help determine, you know, north from uh, clear on back down to earth to that illuminated cityscape where they further disbanded because trout and creek not able to fly up anymore because they're so distant until they either collide with windows and drop to the ground or fall to the ground with exhaustion. So what happened in Chicago last week is over a thousand songbirds collided with one building in particular and fell to their death. Um, so light pollution is a serious issue for that, but it also disrupts our nocturnal pollinator network. So moths are essential members of our pollinator network. Um, they're also important bird food. But if you've ever watched a porch light um, and noticed how the moths are drawn to it, well, what happens is they're drawn to it, they become trapped in that light, they don't go off and pollinate and feed and breed. Instead, they're just like those little songbirds on migration, trapped around that life source. And then they are generally dead by the morning from exhaustion because they didn't go do their important things in your garden because they were trapped in the porch light. 
it also affects us as well. But there's a lot of information about how light pollution is detrimental to the natural world and human health. So if you're not already doing it, we really encourage you to turn off those lights. Um, if you've got windows with bright lights coming from inside your house, consider drawing the shades. But um, the night sky is something to be appreciated and darkness is something to be appreciated. But it's also essential for the well-being of a lot of creatures, including ourselves. Other threats that we can um, inadvertently bring into our um our beautiful biome in the backyard is free roaming cats and window collisions. So uh, these are two primary causes for songbird deaths really all over the world when window collisions and free roaming cats are a serious uh, conservation issue. But I can also say as a wildlife rehabilitator running a songbird only hospital that the number one reason we receive injured songbirds is because of free roaming cats. And during the fall and winter, the second cause of admission is window collisions. Um, during the summer, the second cause of collision is, or the second cause of admission is nest destruction from unseasonal tree trimming. But window collisions uh, claim a lot of lives and as do free roaming cats. The American Bird Conservancy has great information about both of these issues and great information about how to safely keep cats contained, how to give them a full and enriching indoor life. Um, we love to promote the use of catios, which are growing in popularity. So basically they're outdoor enclosures. Some are freestanding and some are connected directly to the home, but it gives the kitty um, outdoor time, fresh air and sunshine, but it also keeps all of our songbirds and smaller wildlife safe. Window treatments um, for the exterior portion of residential and commercial windows is getting very sophisticated, but there are a lot of great um, applications and techniques that we can use to prevent birds from colliding with the windows. So basically what they're doing when they collide with a window is they're mistaking the reflective glass as a uh, clear passage um, and they collide with it obviously. And so there are lots of things that can be done to break up that reflection and prevent birds from colliding with them. So when we create habitat in our garden, we're able to support our bird and insect populations. Um, because we are using this wonderful, diverse array of life-giving California native plants, which will help provide food for the young um, and adult songbirds. We'll be able to provide places for them to nest and find shelter. We'll be able to create refueling stations during migration and help these guys survive and thrive through each, se each season and part of their life cycle. And I put this photo of the little cedar waxwing on our box elder because this was taken in um, mid spring before the box elder had leafed out. And there weren't a lot of berries out there. The toyon was gone um, and there really wasn't anything else in fruit. And I was fascinated by this flock of cedar waxwings that landed in the box elder when times seemed kind of tough for this particular species of bird. And they were actually eating the buds on the box elder, um, which apparently they do. So unbeknownst to me, this tree was a valuable food source for the cedar wax wings. Um, so anyway, the power of native plants um, is uh, stunning. Uh, and when we're able to put them into our home gardens and replace those pansies and petunias with something native, that simple act goes beyond supporting native plants, but it actually helps sustain our songbirds and support biodiversity. And it helps restore nature in our backyards and beyond. And again, our native plants also go a long way toward helping us reduce our carbon footprint because we're not using gas powered gardening equipment, generally speaking. We don't have any lawn need for lawn mowers or chemical fertilizers anymore. And we generally have water wise gardens when we use native plants because they have evolved with our California climate. This is a little hermit thrush here for the winter. 
And thank you. And here are some of our favorite plants um, that we consider habitat heroes in the Songbird Sanctuary Gardens at Native Songbird Care. If you want to snap a screenshot of it or take a, a phone picture of it, be my guest. And then the next screen I have is uh, resources, um, just of helpful links. And that's it. Can I answer any questions? Yes. Oh gosh, Veronica, what a great, what a great talk. I really enjoyed it. And I know that most of our, our members did too. Um, we do have a few questions that people have put in the chat. If anybody else have it, has any other questions, hold them. Let me get through the chat questions and then maybe you can unmute yourself. So um, someone asks, do you have a favorite willow? Oh, <laughs> no, I love all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that willows are one of my favorites. Um, my, I guess my favorite willow in my garden is um, the shining willow. It's, uh, I think, La, La Siandra shining willow is, <laughs> is its common name. You're, I'm terrible with the proper names, but shining willow is definitely one of my favorites. She gets huge though. That's one thing to be aware of. Oh, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, do you pretty much just keep your willows along the, the little drainage area in the back? Yes, there's one growing right on the edge of one of our basins. And then there's a couple other at the front of the property near a small pond. Okay, great. Um, Peter asks, um, can you talk about how to balance gardening for wildlife and fire safety at the same time? Because I'm sure that you're probably in a wooey. So... Um, <laughs> you have those concerns also? So I am a terrible person to ask about that. Um, we have a, I think it's called Firewise Coalition in Sonoma County. And they've got excellent information about um, the different zones, what to plant in the different zones around your home for fire safety. Um, I have the good fortune of um, having one a retired fire chief as a volunteer, and um, he is also a passionate gardener, as safe as it's going to be. Um, so we've limbed up our live oaks. We've tried to bring back vegetation five feet from the house, whereas before we had shrubs growing right on the, well, the wall of the home. Um, and we make sure that our larger trees are trimmed back um, away from the roof of the house. But, um, you know, there are some resources that will tell you, you know, no mulch, no leaf litter. And uh, that's, we need to find a balance. <laughs> we just can't, we just can't, clear the land that serves nobody. And frankly, if you do that, then you're essentially increasing the surface temperature of your land because you've cleared everything that was holding in the moisture. Um, and I would say, you know, in terms of leaf burn times, Las Palitas website has great information um, about leaf burn times. If you're concerned about which types of natives are more pyrophytic than others, um, you know, consult with your local fire department of maybe there you might have some local ordinances that you need to be mindful of um, and talk with your neighbors as well. But I think it needs to be done with care. Um, and I think that the sort of knee jerk reaction we found initially after some of the um, big fires up here, there was a lot of just wholesale clearing of land. And I understand where those fears come from, but I think there's a, a way to do this with um, respect to nature and what nature needs and keeping our homes and self safe. That's that's a really good answer. Thank you very much, Veronica, for that. Um, the Marin chapter has a list of plants, of native plants to replace some of the more fire prone um, ornamentals that people have in their yards. Um, but like, like, like anything, you, 
keeping them away from their house and and in some sense um cutting out some of the dead wood especially where it's near the building let let the the dead wood be further away from the buildings yes yeah. exactly and it's re the resilient landscapes coalition that i i actually have it right here on the resources page but they also have additional information about plant choices and different zones um you know that you're going to plant certain things in within a certain distance from your home etc right that's great okay Murdo asks is there a minimum size where you should group like plants like sages together or buckwheats or fuchsias together or is it better to spread them out uh, throughout the garden <laughs> okay well again i'm probably also the worst person to ask about this because um, this, this question sort of touches on the idea of plant communities. Um, so when you have plant communities, you're obviously you're growing plants together that have sort of co-evolved together, but also have similar needs in terms of soil type, exposure, water needs, et cetera. But there's also um, some interesting ideas about plant groupings and color combinations based on what insects most desire. And even bats, apparently. Um, I guess bats are most drawn to white and yellow flowers. Um, so who knew? But um, there's a lot of information about that. And I, you can definitely do further research. My garden is very haphazard um, in terms of how things are grouped together. It, the idea of plant communities only came to my sphere of consciousness um, maybe five years ago. <laughs> so you'll see. It's like if you ever come visit, it's a patchwork. Okay, good. Um, Vicki asks, which native plants do best in containers? So I've done some experimenting with this and um, my most successful combinations, and these were in some livestock troughs that I'd say were about two feet wide and three feet long and maybe a foot and a half deep. I have one that's filled with red buckwheat and purple needle grass and poppies. I have another one that, um, was filled with, I can't remember the name of it now. Um, it was yarrow and there was something else in there. And then I did another one with some foothill penstemon and um, woolly sunflower. Anyway, they all thrived. Happy as can be, they're in a completely ignored, neglected side of the property behind some aviaries. They hardly in raised beds, essentially, aluminum water troughs hardly got any water this summer and they're doing just fine out there. So that I know did well. Other ex experiments, Syngia, which I know they changed the name, but it's like beach aster um, that did well in a pot. Junkus did well in a pot. Um, cow parsnip did well in a pot. And then, of course, you've got lots of really fun native bulbs that you can experiment with um, that do well in pots. Um, and, oh, I did epilobium. This is just recently um, an epilobium and um, uh, verbena, delamina. It, they look very happy so far. <laughs> So I think you can definitely defer to the various published lists, but I also um, wouldn't hesitate to experiment. You might find a magical combination. Okay, gosh, that, uh, that gives us a lot of ideas. Thank you. Um, Murdo asks again, have you seen any bioswales on a hill? Hmm. I'm meaning like creating a flat or terraced area that's maybe a uh, five foot pond that I might have to keep, but would I have to keep filling it because of the hill? Hmm. I don't know. I think it depends on the composition of the soil that's on the hillside. Um, 
You know, I, we have an amazing man who helped, he engineer our swales after I did them myself and failed miserably. We had uh, somebody from a company called uh, Nucleus Permaculture. So he's a permaculturist. His name's Kevin Rossi. And he also is a water magician and um, just has this incredible way of figuring out where the water wants to go on your land, um, how to best support it in that path of travel and how to maximize its benefits. But I would say if you're wanting to implement something like that on your hillside and you want to engage with a landscaper, maybe find someone who has a permaculture background as well um, and get their thoughts on that. Okay, good ideas, good ideas. Um, Janet, just for um, the dark sky initiative to use yellow bulbs for outside yes. lights. So yellow is preferred um, over the bright white, over the crazy LED that we're seeing so much of right now. Um, yellow is less destructive. Okay. Okay. Um, Larry says, we have a neighbor's cat, which skulks around waiting to pounce on birds, what to do? Have you talked to your neighbors yet? That would be the first step. <laughs> um, so there's uh, the American Bird Conservancy's website under their cat info section. They have um, information on how to talk to your neighbors about their cat and they have lots of material that you can print out and share with them. But I will say in my history um, of supporting songbirds that I have had neighbors with free roaming cats and most of the conversations I've had with them have gone very well. They simply had no idea their cats were doing this. Not that it was really too bothersome for them that their cats were doing that. They were you know, hunting birds, but they were more bothered that their, their neighbor was upset with them about it. <laughs> and uh, one neighbor ended up building a catio for their cat and another a neighbor just ended up converting their cat to an indoor cat. Um, the other thing that we've done when we've had a cat that we've not been able to find its owner of is we've set up motion sensing sprinklers around the areas where it seems to be lurking. And we have security cameras all over the property because of the wildlife hospital. And I can say that those sprinklers make a big impression on the cats because we've seen their reactions. It's kind of, sorry, cat people, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> so that's another option as well. Okay. But Cats shouldn't be outdoors. Okay. Um, we have a request for the plant list. I was wondering if you could just go back a slide and put that Absolutely. up. And we'll leave that up there for, for a while while I go through. Um, the, the next few questions. Sandy says she lives in Orinda and we were, are required to cut all unirrigated shrubs on our property every year. How can no. we educate them? <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. So many communities are really struggling with this. And I think it's a matter of... Um, educating your local government. Um, and if CAL FIRE has been in there, <laughs> in their ear, um, you know, talk to them, check out that Resilient Landscapes Coalition website, because that is, it is a coalition and CAL FIRE is part of that, that coalition. They came up with the criteria about the different types of vegetation to use. So just pull your resources together and go to the powers that be and ask to revisit that ordinance. Okay, that's a great idea. It's Resilient Landscapes Coalition. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Scott asks, how do succulents and cactus fit in with California native? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I don't have any of them in my garden. Oh, that's not true. Um, I have some Dudleya in pots. <laughs> so they're not really, they're on the front porch. But I do see hummingbirds go to them and different insects go to the flowers when they're in bloom. Um, I don't have any cacti in the garden, but what, what I would say is look those plant types up 
Um, I, you know, Calscape is not, not the end all and be all <laughs> in encyclopedia. They get some things wrong, but you can look and on the, the species accounts for the plants, they will tell you who utilizes those plants out in the natural world. And that might give you a better idea um, of, you know, where those plants naturally occur and what types of insect life, bird life, et cetera, utilize them and what they use them for. Yeah, that's a good idea. I know, yeah, certainly Dudleya we have growing naturally in our area and, and there's, I'm not sure about Opuntia, we might have some native Opuntias that, um, it certainly is naturalized in many parts of Northern California. Right. Um, Veronica, we've had so many people that have just said, what a great talk and good presentation, wonderful information. Is there anybody that's online still who would like to just unmute themselves and ask Veronica a question verbally? Just, you can just um, unmute and, and ask away. No, nope. I guess they put them. Oh, oh. I have one question about roses you talk about earlier. Is it roses bushes so good for the bird to hide or no? Oh, the rose bush that I tore out. Yeah. Um. There's a. I. I thought that would be a good for the bird to hide, but you tell me. <laughs> well, our our native rose is excellent cover for the birds. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, I mean, I guess there are some types of, of um, ornamental roses that could provide good cover. But if you are going to convert your garden into a garden that is to create um, more valuable habitat, there are a lot of native shrubs that can be chosen instead that still have the same beautiful aesthetics as a rose bush, but have a whole lot more to offer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's great. Okay, we have one, um, Heidi asks, do you have any thoughts about eucalyptus chips on pathways and gardens? And does it denigrate the soil? <laughs> so I, all of the chips on our pathways come directly from any kind of tree work that we do on our property. I get a little bit fussy about bringing material outside in. And from what I have heard from others who have used eucalyptus chips on their pathways, they have not had a problem in terms of it damaging the soil and um, what is it? Allopathic makes the soil allopathic. Um, yes. And that's probably because they have a good border between the path and their garden beds, I would imagine. Um, but, you know, I don't know enough about that topic to say. Just my gut tells me if that's all you were using and you were using it over and over, you are refurbishing your pathways exclusively with eucalyptus trips, chips, chips that uh, over time it could potentially have a, a a detrimental impact because yeah. they will yeah. break down the soil. Right, right. Yeah, and you know, when you go to eucalyptus forest, there's not much growing in it besides no. more eucalyptus. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how they do that. Yes. Oh, well, <laughs> Veronica, I just want to thank you so much again. This has really been a, a very informational as well as pretty presentation. So um, I appreciate it. And I, I hope that we'll be able to post the video of this on our YouTube channel so people can get those little details all over again. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. I'm going to say good night to everyone and we hope to see you in November. Okay. Great. Goodbye. Happy gardening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>